Hello, webinar world. Uh, this is Autumn Piccolo. I'm one of the co-founders of the American Ivy Association, and we are so excited for today's event. Um, I'm waiting another minute or so for everyone to jump on. We had hundreds of people register for this webinar, and we are um, very thankful that everyone is joining us today. For those of you who attended the AVA Business Academy in Delray Beach, Florida, you saw this incredible speaker. And we've got uh, another presentation here today that we are excited to bring you. This is a hot button issue, a regulatory issue, and uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Kratz, will be presenting on this issue today. Uh, she is the owner of Pharmacy Upward. She's a wealth of information and she's got an awesome presentation today. So another 30 seconds or so and we'll be getting started. There are, let's see, we got a bunch of people on and people joining right now. So I'm going to turn it over to her shortly. Uh, a couple of ground rules. We have everyone on mute just so that everyone can hear clearly. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to submit them through the portal. We will receive them after the webinar. Uh, Jennifer will do her best to answer anything that she can get to at the end, depending on the amount of time we have, but we are able to see all of your questions um, and we will address them individually after if we don't get to them. Everyone will be receiving a copy of the presentation as well. At the end, we'll be emailing that along with a link to view the recording. So hang with us. We're going to change over to Jennifer's uh, desktop here and get started. Thanks again. All right, thanks so much, Autumn, for that. And I wanna thank everybody for coming out today in the middle of the day um, for the AIVA Lunch and Learn series. Okay, so it looks like more people are joining, so. I wanna welcome everybody today. Um, my name is Jennifer Kratz. Um, I've been working diligently on this because I know there have been a lot of questions um, regarding USP 797. And so I'm really excited to share some of these things with you today. And so we'll just start right in. It looks like we'll have more people joining, but. Again, we're gonna share these slides with you afterwards um, and also field more questions. So please feel free to use the chat button for any questions. All right, our objectives today, we're gonna to go over immediate use, category one, two, and three, and what that means, beyond use date, cleaning training and certifying and documenting, and adverse event reporting. Those are the main things that are going to affect your IV vitamin business. So just a quick clarification. So USP 797 was published November 1st, 2022, which was here recently, which is why this is of an essence of an urgency. It will be official November 1st. Um, that means uh, they are allowing, uh, while well, your board of pharmacy and FDA will allow one year uh, for these changes to be implemented. I will say if you don't have any of 797 implemented, now would be the time. Um, that's the reason we're going over this as well today. There are 21 sections in USP 797. We will only be focusing on the ones that apply to the IV vitamin therapy business. So again, I do have colleagues from the pharmacy industry that are here. Um, this is obviously not specifically for pharmacy. Um, our target market and audience here for the practitioners and people that are in the IV vitamin therapy business um, arena. So first, of course, it goes over section one, it's the introduction and scope of USP 797, it's guidance document. Um, USP 797, well, the USP is a non-governmental agency. Um, so they are just used as um, a guidance document for your board of pharmacy and the FDA for compliance. So this document gets a lot of weight, um, so that's why it is very important. Um, it does uh, outline the minimum standards to be followed for a preparation of a CSP, compounded sterile preparation. I will use CSP often in this presentation. Please know that it's shortened for compounded sterile preparation. 
And um, so as we all know, sterile compounding is defined as combining, admixing, dilutant, pooling, reconstituting, repackaging, and otherwise altering a drug product or bulk drug, drug substance to create a sterile preparation. So again, if, the, if you're only doing non-sterile, this does not apply to you. We are only going over USP 797, which is, is specifically for sterile preparations. So uh, why do we compound pharmaceuticals? We usually do it because drug shortages, risk mitigation, minimize harm due to microbial contamination and quality. Um, and then the IV business, we of course are forced to compound pharmaceuticals because of the nature of the IV vitamin bags that we are building um, our patient specific. Um, and they typically don't come as a, uh, in a one vial solution. So one of the main changes and the thing that we'll probably spend the most time on even in questions um, is that they clarified the definition of immediate use. Um, and it actually is a broader definition. So I truly believe that the IV vitamin therapy business falls predominantly in the immediate use CSP section, um, which is the 1.3. So the outline of that and the uh, pieces that are the most important is that is prepared for a single patient, prepared from not more than three different sterile products, unused medication from a single dose vial must be discarded, Administration must begin within four hours from the start of a preparation. And if the person who made that bag is not going to be the one administering it, it must be properly labeled. Um, so those are the main things that I believe, um, even the mobile practitioners, um, you know, the people that are you know, mixing the bags, you know, when they arrive at the patient's home, uh, or if they are making it even in an office setting, if you're administering it to the patient within that four hour time frame, you qualify for immediate use. And so if you don't need a longer than four hour BUD, I believe the immediate use now includes IV vitamin therapy business as a whole. Before, when it was written, it did not, it was very unclear. Um, but that being said, you know, anytime you are injecting a sterile product, it is assumed that you're using proper aseptic technique. Um, so the four hours is, should be enough time for you to administer it. Um, immediate use does not require training, um, but this should be in your company SOPs. You should have a designated person identified. Obviously, you have to use aseptic technique. Nurses and doctors must also comply with the training. Um, so that is kind of broad. And that is the part that you, as a practitioner or a business owner, need to look at and make sure that your SOPs um, fully cover IV vitamin therapy um, to be within the immediate use guidelines of USP 797. So um, when all of those conditions are met for immediate use, um, you are not subject to category one, two, or three. Now, why is that important? Because as you can see here, um, I know that's a lot of information, but again, I wanted you to have something that you can use as a reference. As you look at this, you can see immediate use has the BUD of four hours. The category one, is where you start if you wanted to get a longer BUD of 12 to 24 hours. This of course requires the use of an ISO class five PEC in an unclassified area. Um, we have had a lot of questions, a lot of inquiries, you know, should I have an ISO class five? You know, I would say yes, if you have um, a practice and you can actually um, you have room for an ISO class five. That is the aseptic um, standard, um, you know, of, of better aseptic use. So even if you are preparing them, um, you know, preparing them within an ISO class five is definitely going to be, um, you know, uh, better than not. Um, that being said, if you are going to use an ISO class five, there are a lot of um, 
procedures and certifications and SOPs that will need to be put in place. Um, it, of course, does not serve you best to have an ISO class five and you don't do proper cleaning, training, um, documenting, um, and keeping all of your records uh, square with that. Now, as you get to category two and three, those are obviously geared towards compounding pharmacies. I do not foresee IV vitamin therapy practices having an ISO class seven buffer room or an ante room. So as you look at those uh, BUDs, those are going to be more subject to what the compounding pharmacies will be uh, uh, revolving in. Um, so, but when you have those spans of one to 45 days, four to 60 days, you have to keep in mind that the, the, the BUD, it looks like it, it's, it's between that, but really you would have to go back and, you know, are you using sterile, non-sterile, um, you know, how are you uh, sterilizing it? So all of that is more applicable to the uh, compounding pharmacies and not to the IV vitamin business. I, I'm pretty sure we're just looking at category one um, for most businesses, at least all that I have uh, dealt with. So beyond use date, I'm sure you guys are aware of that. That's when you are compounding these uh, products, when you put them together, um, it applies to all of them. Um, and the BUDs, like I had referred to before, they are assigned for different storage conditions, whether it has an additive or not. Um, they are not expiration dates. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, the expiration dates are assigned by manufacturers of conventionally manufactured products. Um, so BUDs are, are the uh, uh, beyond use date that you would assign to the um, product that you would combine in an IV um, bag in your practice. So what are the factors that determine your BOD, BUD? Again, um, you know, all of these are here, the environment which the um, compounding product is prepared, um, whether it's aseptic or not for sterilization. Again, I doubt anybody here would be sterilizing things, but you need to know that that is a factor, you know, as you uh, go forward. Or even um, a good point that I wanted to say is as you are looking to your compounding pharmacies, um, know that they are going to have to um, apply these also um, as they, uh, if they are being uh, contracted with to create the uh, IV bags for you, um, you know, they will be subject to a lot of these to determining the BUD of the products that they are then selling to you. So the thing with this is that you need to be prepared for most of the 503A pharmacies um, to over the next year are going to have to amend their BUDs. Um, you know, and, and, and is that a problem? Well, the purpose of this, pro of this document is, of course, to increase um, the quality of the products that you're giving your patients. So as we see these, uh, the compounding pharmacies in, in business today, you know, they're going to be subject to much shorter BUDs, um, you know, absent them having their own sterility and potency testing, um, which will also open up, you know, a lot more opportunity for the 503B pharmacies. I um, mean, we can get into, and in, in, probably in our podcast, we're gonna have some podcasts after this, um, into the uh, the difference between 503A and B. So if you don't know the difference, please tune into those podcasts. Um, but for now, we're just focusing on the 503A and how the 797 is going to change um, the way these pharmacies are going to have to operate. And so as you guys have partnerships with these pharmacies, um, you know, I do want you to know, you know, that these are the things that they're going to have to implement to change. Um, so move this over so I can see. Um, so again, um, you know, I, I want you to evaluate your administration time. And when I say administration time, 797 is only um, for the compounded product um, and, and uh, combining them. Once um, the product is being administered, it does not cover that. So the administration of a product is actually um, going to fall under, um, you know, regulations, starting with your board of pharmacy, CDC, um, and uh, possibly the FDA, but um, it's usually CDC. 
So, you know, that's outside of the scope of 797 once you administer it. But when you have a four hour administration or BUD, um, that means you can start that IV at hour four, even if it's a three hour um, uh, IV bag that you have. You can, uh, as long as you start administration at hour four, you can still administer a three hour um, uh, IV. So again, you know, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the 503A pharmacies are gonna be limited to 90, uh, 90 days. I wouldn't expect them to have anything over 180 days unless they have a potency study, which again, uh, I don't think it's financially feasible for most 503A pharmacies to um, do that. Um, so this is just also, just for information, this actually didn't change is section 16 um, regarding the use of single dose and multi-dose CSPs. Um, single dose is still, um, uh, must be used uh, within 12 hours, uh, multi-dose 28 days. Again, there are exceptions and I just wanted to put this in here because I know I have a lot of um, uh, pharmacies that do ophthalmic that might be listening in and yes, I hear you, yours is a little different, but for the purpose of this um, talk being IV vitamin therapy, um, I'm not gonna go into the BUDs of ophthalmics. Um, all right, so if you decide that you want to have an ISO 5, um, there are some things that are uh, outlined in USP 797 in section four about where it goes. Um, this of course will be something that you'll have to work either with an engineer, your certified uh, um, inspector who is going to certify your um, ISO class five. Um, you know, there are certain ins and outs with your uh, HEPA filter um, that will uh, need to be evaluated. Um, again, the sterile compounding environment is the area around your ISO 5 um, PEC. So, um, you know, again, if there is, if there's no buffer room and ante room, which of course I don't believe anybody here will, um, that's where it is only going to fall under category one CSP. And just know that it is not going to give you, um, you know, more than 24 hours BUD on that preparation um, once you put it together. Um, you know, it also goes into guidelines with cleaning, you know, the location of it, um, all of that will need to be. Um, uh, certified and looked at and you can um, usually the companies that you buy the ISO 5 clean room will have consultants that can come and help you or you can pay an independent one to come and help you with proper placement. Um, so again if you have an ISO 5 clean room you are going to need to do airflow testing, uh, HEPA filter integrity testing, total particle count testing, and uh, the smoke test. Um, these are all things that you'll have to document and these are typically done um, on a six to 12 month basis. Um, there's some schools of thought that recommend every six months, but really uh, the language sticks with every year. Um, the more in depth ones are going to be obviously daily cleaning. Um, you will have to document um, monthly sporic sporicidal um, applications. So again, if you're gonna have that ISO 5 clean room, there's no point in having it unless you are fully vested um, in monitoring, properly monitoring the air quality surfaces, um, doing the testing. Most, some of it you can do yourself, some of it you'll have to send off to a third party um, inspector. All right, along with it, even if you're doing um, immediate use, you are going to have to instill SOPs in your business. Um, you will need to also develop uh, training and testing with an assessment um, every six to 12 months, 12 months of course being um, the most, every six months is more ideal. Um, they will have to demonstrate their knowledge um, uh, as well as doing aseptic manipulation, gloved fingertip, thumb sampling, media field testing, um, initial training and competency programmed program. Again, all of these will be in your SOPs. Um, there are some standard ones out there that I've seen some consultants um, produce, um, but you really need to make these so that they best suit your business. Again, a lot of these SOPs will be different. If you don't uh, compound or mix IV mixtures every day, you don't have to do some of um, you know the the cleaning every day. But your SOPs, you know, and depending on who is involved with 
um, the mixing of these sterile preparations in your facility. Um, all of that will be outlined, you know, whether you do it seven days a week or three days a week. Um, and then their competency testing, uh, you know, if you're a one man show, then I would recommend you videoing um, the competency and maybe getting out an outside uh, uh, person to evaluate that. If you are the owner, administrator, and you've been the, you've designated yourself as the person, the DP, according to 797, um, you know, you, you will need to have documentation that you have passed your own tests, if you will. All right. Um, one of the other most important things that I don't think gets enough weight, and I think as an industry, if we are going to grow and be sustainable, we need to make sure that we have proper adverse event reporting. Um, largely overlooked because no one wants to admit that maybe something went wrong or a patient had a hard time. But this documentation is paramount. Um, you have to put in place you know, how you're going to deal with these adverse events. If it is something that could have been avoided, um, whether you've rectified the situation, um, any research that you did to figure out why something went wrong or a patient had a reaction. Because at the end of the day, these adverse events, if you don't document them and the patient goes to the FDA and says, this company is harming public health, the FDA is going to come in and ask you what you did <laughs> to correct these actions. So adverse event reporting um, is, is very important. Um, this should also be um, uh, documented in your business SOPs. Um, there are certain steps that must be taken. Um, you know, again, your designated person will review all of these. Um, if you have a medical director, of course, you're going to want them to be a part of it. Um, you know, these are things that, um, you know, are very important and I truly believe it is, is very overlooked in a lot of these businesses. Um, so again, the, the adverse event reporting, um, you know, it, it's not so much that it has changed, but they did put more emphasis on it um, in the current revisions. Um, uh, so it deserved being noted for the purpose of this um, talk today. So the key takeaways are that I, I truly believe that, you know, the they, USP 797 did a, this industry a huge favor by clarifying immediate use, um, meaning most of the people that I know in this industry, you know, will be able to utilize that, um, you know, we do have a lot of interest in ISO class five um, PECs. I highly recommend it. Um, that is the way that you can bring things up a notch, um, but be prepared for the, the monitoring and the cleaning and the documenting. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that's, you know, it is a commitment, um, but if it's for, if it's a commitment for the better of the industry, then we are all for it, especially AIVA and their interest in making this a better, more sustainable industry. Um, that being said, even if you're doing immediate use, documenting your SOPs, training your staff, uh, finding your designated person, um, making sure everybody is tested on a regular basis is going to be very important. Um, so again, so the changes to the USP 790 cent largely affects the pharmacies that you purchase from. Um, so as we go forward in this industry, you know, prepare to see changes. Uh, if you don't know whether you're purchasing from a 503A or 503B pharmacy, now's the time for you to discover that because it does have make a difference on the products that you are offering um, at your facility. Um, so we did, uh, I am going to uh, look at some of the questions um, that have been submitted as we were talking, but these are the ones that were submitted ahead of time. Um, so do you need a hood to mix and are hoods required in Texas? Um, so again, going back to the scope of USP 797, it does not talk about um, states specifically, but your BARDA pharmacy is who you need to talk to. Um, right now, um, they may or may not have 
specific language saying that you are required to mix in an ISO 5 um, hood. Um, I believe some states do, but they, they really are changing. And because of USP 797 um, recently getting um, revised, um, there are going to be changes in the next year. Be prepared for your board of pharmacy in whatever state you are licensed and practice in to take um, the USP um, guidance and they might want uh, and require you. Um, but right now it's a it's basically defined as a should. You should have an ISO 5 clean room um, unless your board of pharmacy specifies that you must. Um, uh, so and just know that if you even if your board of pharmacy does not require it for immediate use, then um, you know it is definitely an ad additive for you to have it at your for your business. Um, so we did have a question: What's the average shelf life of vitamins? Um, I did appreciate this question. USP 797 does not give an average shelf life of vitamins, um, but I will refer back to. Um, the BUD uh, that you are going to be getting from your compounding pharmacy is going to change. Um, and so the BUDs, the longer BUDs, will more than likely come from your 503B pharmacies because they've done sterility and potency um, on these products. Um, you know, the average shelf life will be less than 90 days. Um, but, you know, that that's that's, of course, based on you know, when you received the product um, and that particular pharmacy and, and what they've assigned to the BUD. So speaking to mobile and concierge services, how, it is, how is this impacting their mixing and administration? Again, you know, uh, you, you want to mix, you know, within four hours of administration to the patient. Um, that's that's pretty much what it has affected them. Um, I haven't really seen too many practices where they mix them in an office and then take them in the field. But that being said, that's that's not out of the question. You would just have to do it within that four hours. Um, and if you do it in an ISO five, obviously you have um, 12 to 24 hours. 24 hours if it's refrigerated. 12 hours um, room temperature. Um, so the necessary steps to ensure mo mobile and brick and mortar is practicing above standards. That would be the use of the ISO 5. Um, you know, but with that, it's not just the investment in the ISO 5 clean room. It's going to be the investment in, like I had said before, the training, the documenting, the certification of your, um, your uh, ISO 5. Um, that's going to be the big investment um, of time and daily record keeping. Um, so what are the effects and new restrictions that USB 797 have for our operation in the state of Virginia? Again, this is not state specific. Your board of pharmacy is state specific. Um, so I feel like that's a, you know, you'll, you'll have to um, basically stay in touch with your board of pharmacy because there's a good chance all these boards of pharmacies are going to revise what they have based on 797. So if they want their practitioners to have better aseptic technique, they're probably going to put stricter um, regulations in for their state. Um, and so the other question is mobile exceptions in the home. Um, that's at four hours. You know, I mean, you go back to the immediate use. You know, I mean, you want to go back to that. Chapter 1.3, um, and make sure you're within those guidelines. Um, uh, you know, typically the person, the, the practitioner that is mixing the uh, IV bags in somebody's home, they're the, also the one that administers it. So um, it's pretty easy to stay within that BUD. Um, so uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell for um, things that apply to the IV vitamin therapy business. I do want to open it up to take some of the questions that might have been brought in um, uh, through the chat. Autumn, can you help me with some of those? Yeah, let me see if I can pull these up. Hang on just a second, please. Uh, 
all right, I'm not getting the questions that went through the chat here. So anybody that has questions, um, feel free to add them to the chat box um, from the GoToWebinar platform, or you're welcome to reply to your registration confirmation email, um, or send the questions directly to Jennifer. I think her email is listed on the presentation there. So if you have questions, we are happy to answer them. Um, go ahead and send them through. Uh, other than that, Jennifer, if you're all wrapped up, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, as I said earlier, Ava is committed to being the leading industry resource with the most comprehensive education and information available. And I know that we will be, we will be having Jennifer on the podcast, um, as well as publishing some articles and more information coming to you on this topic. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, the Ava website is nearly complete and will be launching any day now. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for additional webinars. We have three more um, webinars scheduled between now and the end of the year and registration is open. So keep an eye on your email box and stay with us. We love being a part of this industry and we thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye.